Coming up on Tech News Today, apparently a Microsoft Xbox announcement's coming soon. Google Fiber pretty much certain to be coming to Austin, Texas. And Sony brings the price of 4K TV down. Anybody want it, though? All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, April 8th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Ring Central. We do everything in the cloud. That's why we love our cloud based phone system by Ring Central. Zero startup costs and Ring Central is $20 a month per user. Try it now with a 30 day risk free trial. Buy one desk phone, get a second phone free, up to 20 phones. Call 800 543 9980 or visit ringcentral.com and use our promo code TWIT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting each time with the top 10 of the day in the news views. The Verge reports Motoco.com has leaked a pre-release version of Facebook Home, the new app for Android that takes over your home and lock screen and integrates in all the Facebook goodness. Facebook announced the app would only work on five phones, but Motoco says they've got it working on a wide range of devices, including the Nexus 4 phone and the Nexus 7 tablet. Simply allow install from unknown sources in the settings and apparently you're on your way. Mileage may vary. Telecom equipment maker Ericsson has announced it's acquiring Microsoft's Media Room IPTV business, which makes software that allows operators to deliver television over the Internet. Rumors about this started at the end of last month, uh, came from Bloomberg initially. Microsoft took to its blog as well, saying that the acquisition is mutually beneficial and strategically aligned for both parties. HTC reported some financials and things aren't so great for the company. Its profit was down 98% compared to last year. Yikes. The company was hit hard due to the delayed launch of its new flagship phone, the HTC One. HTC's net profit was about $2.8 million, which is its lowest quarterly net profit since 2006. Win Super Sites' Paul Therott, host of Windows Weekly right here on Twit, and The Verge both agree Microsoft will announce details of its next game console on May 21st in advance of E3, which isn't until June 11th. So they've got about a month jump on E3 by doing this announcement. Therott said the event was originally scheduled for April 24th, but was moved. The Verge reports the event will be small with the first details announced and then reserving the big unveil for E3. Paul also added he hears the console will be around $500 with a $300 annual Xbox Live subscription and must be internet connected to use. Deal with it. Live in California? <laughs> yes. yes. Drive a lot? Yeah, I do. Sometimes. Yeah, all right. Well, now you can be pulled over for using your GPS while driving. I can have it. The state's current ban on texting while driving has been expanded via an appellate court. California versus Spriggs has argued that the distraction would be present whether the wireless telephone was being used as a telephone, a GPS navigator, a clock, or a device for sending and receiving texts and emails. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office withdrew some of its concerns over Apple's trademark application for the iPad Mini. Originally, the USPTO issued a statement saying the word mini may not be subject to trademark as it is merely descriptive. The new position by the office is that Apple would be required to display a disclaimer when it uses the word mini that says no claim is made to the exclusive right to use mini apart from the mark as shown. If Apple doesn't do that, the USPTO may refuse to register the entire mark. Does the disclaimer have to be the same type and font? Is everything else? Because that would make I did the not specify. Hilarious. Friday evening, Google announced that they would make an announcement in conjunction with the city of Austin on Tuesday at 11 a.m. Central Time. Austin's KVU TV and Venture Beat both reported almost immediately that the announcement would, in fact, be Google Fiber Internet coming to the live music capital of the world. And Gadget reported a reader spotted a post on Google Fiber's blog at 3 a.m. Saturday morning titled. Google Fiber's next stop, Austin, Texas, with some dummy text. The post has since disappeared, but looks like we know what they're going to announce. 
Does Austin really call itself the live music capital of the world? or is that It, it just does call itself it? that, yes. Well, that's nice. Sony's got pricing and a release date for its new 4K LED televisions, and now the company has announced more details about its 4K FMPX1 media player coming out of NAB. The device looks like what Sony showed off at CES in January and will be available sometime this summer for $699. The FMPX1 will be bundled with 10 films including Bad Teacher, the remake of The Karate Kid, and Taxi Driver. Ars Technica's Nate Anderson reports that an ISP seems to be injecting its own ads onto every web page it serves to its subscribers. Robert Sylvie and PhD student Zach Henkel both described discovering code in pages accessed with a connection from CMA Communications that routed ads from a service called Route 66, spelled R66T. After Anderson contacted CMA, their terms of service suddenly changed on April 4th to describe a digital layer of information provided by Route 66 and requiring users to waive their right to sue. According to Digital Trends, Google is currently in negotiation to buy WhatsApp for somewhere in the neighborhood of $1 billion. Ooh. The talk started four or five weeks ago, and apparently WhatsApp is playing a hardball with Google and is looking to get even more money than Google's offering. WhatsApp is a messaging app that lets its users send text, audio, video, and images to each other. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Ring Central. When we built the Twit Studios, one of the things we didn't want to have to do was spend a lot of money on telephone equipment, but we still needed telephones at the desk for a lot of people for the workplace. So the solution was easy. When Russell, our IT guy, said, do it in the cloud, we were like, what does that mean? He said, get Ring Central. It's in the cloud. It's a no brainer. We love Ring Central. Zero startup costs, no PBX hardware to install or maintain. Don't know what PBX hardware is? Don't worry about it. You don't need to know. It's just costly and it takes up a lot of space. Get Ring Central. It allows you to easily customize all your call handling. Our producers can get their voicemail and their email. And we even get all our fax messages right on our smartphones. Ring Central offers all inclusive pricing as low as $20 a month per user. And you can start right now with a 30 day risk free trial and a special offer for our listeners. When you buy one desk phone, you get a second phone free up to 20 phones. So do this right now. Call this number, 800-543-9980. That's designated for our listeners, 800-543-9980. Once again, 800-543-9980. Or go to ringcentral.com and use promo code TWIT. That's ringcentral.com. Promo code TWIT. We thank Ring Central for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now, we also thank for his support of Tech News Today, Ewan Rankin. The Prime Minister of the British Tech Network. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you for joining us. You're most welcome. How are you doing, sir? <laughs> it's good to have you, man. Uh, I hear you're, uh, you threw at your back. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, no. Old man injury, though. I'm fine. Well, uh, you can lie down during the show. It's totally fine. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, no, no worries. Let's uh, let's start off talking about Microsoft's plan uh, to uh, focus on Xbox. They they did sell the Media Room IPTV business. Sarah, tell us about that. Yeah, they sold it to uh, Ericsson. Uh, both parties have have released statements saying that this is mutually beneficial, as I mentioned in the news views. And Media Room, if you're kind of like, what is Media Room? It's a, it's 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 an IPTV business. Um, it basically lets operators deliver television online over the internet uh, media room powers 22 million set top boxes in 11 million subscriber households so now with ericsson as boss here will be the leading provider of iptv and multi-screen solutions got a market share of about uh, 25 percent in its class um, and that puts it uh, ericsson rather in a lead position for tv anywhere consumption um, media room is used by service providers like at&t's uverse deutsche telecoms entertain Telefonica, Swisscom. Uh, so, oh my goodness, somebody's yelling outside. Uh, and yeah, so it's it's uh, it's based in uh, Mountain View, California, but they've got um, about 400 employees around the world. What's interesting, though, Tom, and you mentioned uh, in the news views, is is kind of this this Xbox tie-in. Uh, Microsoft is kind of like, you know, we are just going to put all of our efforts and all of our resources um, into into Xbox. That's that's where uh, we want our efforts uh, to, to to be based. Um, and Xbox is, you know, Microsoft's trying to build a cloud TV platform uh, for Xbox. And um, this whole event that apparently started out as an April 24th event that Microsoft was supposed to be holding to talk about the Xbox now has been pushed to, as Paul Thrott um, and The Verge are both saying, May 21st, which is still ahead of E3. Uh, you and do, do you think that there's... 
Do you think that this makes sense? Is is there a need for a smaller uh, sort of let's talk about what's going to be ahead at E3 for the Xbox? Uh, with, with this, the whole thing about the, the, the TV process, I mean, the, the Windows Media has never worked particularly well unless you've got a Windows Media PC that's transmitting directly to your Xbox. And I'm surprised that, that the sale of, of this system, because it, for a start, it's Silverlight powered. So I'm sure that Xbox, uh, Microsoft aren't giving up their patents on, on Silverlight for this. And I think the devil's in the detail about what they're actually buying and how much it's going to actually contribute back to the Xbox. I mean, at E3, you'd expect something that's going to be pretty earth-shattering, you'd hope, from Microsoft. It, the TV element of that has got to be there. So I don't understand selling this bit off right now, it, it, unless there's some dual kickback thing, which with both companies saying that they're mutually beneficial, I think that probably is, is in there. I was over the weekend, actually it was Friday afternoon, we had talked about uh, Adam Orth, who was the Microsoft Studios creative director, so kind of not saying, listen, the next Xbox is going to have an always-on type of a thing, you know, have to be connected to the internet, but was pretty vocal about the fact that people need to get used to the idea. Microsoft issued an apology uh, saying, we're very sorry if this offended anybody and that he doesn't, he's not a spokesperson for Microsoft Although doesn't really deny anything, just says that that's not the way that Microsoft would communicate directly with our loyal customers. Now, you would hope the spokesperson wouldn't say deal with it. That's not the, the Microsoft way. Sure, <laughs> sure. But it's also somewhat curious that Microsoft, it was a, it, it's an apology, but a pretty vague one too. Uh, there's, there's a good chance the Xbox is going to need an always on connection anyway. A lot of the a lot of the thoughts are to avoid piracy. You could authenticate all the games this way. You always are connected. And again, Xbox Live is obviously really beneficial when you have an internet connection. So the idea that Microsoft and, and Sony both are thinking about having always-on connections on their devices doesn't sound that surprising considering that's the way things have been going on the PC anyway. So it's, it's likely to happen. I mean, Paul Therott thinks it, and there's a good chance he's on the ball. He's really good at covering Microsoft stuff. So I, I'm thinking that Microsoft just wants to control the message better than deal with it. It's going to be like, here you go. And they'll write it in small print somewhere, like, oh, always on. Tom, what do you think? Do you think uh, selling off this media room arm uh, to Ericsson makes sense for Microsoft to free up some resources for, 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 for what their, you know, their core business ends up being? Yeah, I think it could. And I, and I think that uh, that $300 service charge that Paul Therott mentioned uh, might be coming down the pike points to where we're going here. What Microsoft is betting on is that the future is actually internet TV, not IPTV. They're saying, look, we, we tried the ultimate TV as a competitor to TiVo back in the day. That didn't work. We've actually turned that into a decently profitable business selling cable boxes to set top boxes to cable companies. Th that business is dying. That's what Microsoft seems to be saying here. We're going to put all bets on internet television over a console, and we've been trying to make Xbox that console for a long time. So if anything justifies a $300 a year Xbox Live account, it's some beefed up entertainment service, uh, probably television, movies, music, and your video games all combined in one. That, that's going to be a big pitch because that's a big price hike that they're talking about. But if remember, they've partnered up with cable companies on the Xbox. Uh, so if they can provide some sort of internet only aspect of that, or maybe some partnerships with somebody like an HBO where you get some internet only television that's part of that Xbox Live subscription, that could be huge. And that, that could make that suddenly seem like a... Uh, a decent idea and and they're not going to come out and say $300 a year they're going to divide that by 12 and they they're going to make they're going to make it sound a lot cheaper that'd be my guess i just don't understand why they're doing a may 21st announcement yeah that that whole thing is a little odd as well it's yeah like, they, it's, it's like what uh, what do you announce while still holding back enough right. so that you don't pre-announce something and take the sales out of you know the e3 announcement I mean, wouldn't you just and say major Nelson would you just say, here's our product and here's what you're going to be able to play with at E3? That kind of thing. Try to build a big drive towards that. I'm sure if it's the television aspect, they might be announcing partners. And then, yeah, you actually want to play the thing? We'll have it ready. As opposed to Sony's, hey, we got a box and nobody can use it. <laughs> yeah, and there's no box. Because that Major Nelson made a big deal about the fact that Sony didn't show you the actual box. So we'll see if, if Microsoft does. All right, let's talk a little bit about this uh, Google Fiber. Uh, I think people are a little surprised that we hadn't heard any leaks because you need a lot of governmental approval if you want to go into a city uh, and start rolling out fiber. But it looks like for sure, based on all these other these leaks that happened since Friday, uh, that that's what we're going to see. 
I asked why why do you think they picked Austin? Kansas City was was sort of a, a surprising pick because it isn't considered a big tech hub. Did they, are they going the opposite way? Austin has a ton of tech companies. You know, I had I've never been to Austin. I know very little about it. And so I had to look it up this morning. I'm like, what's what's big about this town that would bring Google over. It does have a pretty large population, over 800,000 people. Live music capital of the world. That's what they say, and they're called the Silicon Hills as well. They have a bunch of nicknames. There are tons of tech companies that have bases there. So I'm thinking if Google wants to go into Austin, it would be a, ma a major push because Kansas City has something like 150,000 people. This has 800,000. If they can scale to a large city, now this isn't necessarily saying that Google, Google is going to cover the entire city in fiber, but if they could... 800,000 people could be a, a great thing for Google to say, yeah, we can hook this up almost anywhere because this big town can support it. And, and what, what do you think about that idea of hooking it up almost anywhere? You and I mean, do you see Google becoming an ISP, doing this in a bunch of cities, maybe bringing it, you know, across the ocean to you guys over there in England? <sighs> I'd love to think that Google was going to give fiber to the door to the entire world one city at a time, but I think Birmingham would be pretty well down on the list by the time it gets to us. Um, it'd be nice. I mean, the question is the pricing and that kind of stuff, because a lot of the ISP stuff here in the UK certainly initially is subsidized to get to get you into the process. Um, and then it's where do you monetize from there if, you, if you're not charging enough to cover the overhead from the first place. And Google aren't going to be sending ads down to cover the cost of, of their ISP setup. So, again, it depends on the price and it depends where they see the revenue coming back in or whether it's one of these egalitarian things that they're looking just to break even on it. But, yeah, I'll have it. Give it me. We've got 120 yeah. megabits a second over here. So, you know, we're okay for speed. It's not too bad. Austin, to me, seems like a really good fit uh, for this. You know, again, it's... Kansas City is a much smaller city than Austin and not necessarily uh, the city that people say, ah, tech hub. Uh, but Austin really is. Um, there are a lot of uh, not only large companies that are based out of Austin, uh, but but it has a thriving startup scene, um, you know, it, outside of South by Southwest where people come in from other places, you know, to to to, to communicate with each other, you know, and the and the tech scene. And, you know, it's a large city, but it's not massive. You've got under a million people, at least in the metropolitan area. Um, and, and I think that this is, a, this is a, you know, Google's not just picking Austin out of a hat. This is a city that um, is going to not only appreciate something like Google Fiber, but you could probably see some, uh, some really interesting statistics and early results as far as how it's going to change the scene that's already there. I mean, we've seen it in Kansas City already, but Austin already has that thriving tech, tech, uh, Presence. Tech, yeah, the tech presence, exactly. Matt in it's the chat room saying... Go ahead, Ewan. Sorry, I was just saying, Matt in the chat room saying, didn't Austin apply for the testbed position that Kansas City initially got? So this could be a, a kind of fallback. Right, the, the miscongeniality of winning the Google Fiber auction. You get it Something second. like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, by the the size of the metro areas are actually very similar. Uh, Austin has a population of 800,000 as, as I has pointed out, and Kansas City only has 400,000, but metro area for Kansas City is 2.1 million, and it's 1.8 million for Austin. So scale-wise, this may be a similar thing where they can say, well, we know how to roll out in that kind of area, but usage-wise is going to be a lot different because whereas Kansas City benefited by saying, hey, startups, now you can come to Kansas City. We have a small community, but it can get bigger. Austin already has a big community, and so that's going to stress that network out a little more. Um, I, I I think I think for what Sarah said though it makes a it makes a really good choice it makes a very logical choice and I think that uh, perhaps I don't know um, my neighborhood would be a good third choice. Let's move on to Sony uh, bringing the cost of 4K TVs down. They're certainly not bargains, but uh, what did they announce at NAB? Well, I asked. Compared to the 84 inch twenty-five thousand dollar TVs, these do sound like a bargain. Uh, Sony announced some pricing of some of its televisions. It showed off at CES. There's a 55-inch 4K TV. It's going to cost $6,000. The 65-inch model is going to cost $7,000. And this is the pricing was today. Uh, both are going, going to be available online and retail on the 21st of April. And then Sony also announced that 4K media player. As Sarah mentioned, the FMP-X1, which I think stands for freaking media player. Uh, mm -hmm. X1, which <laughs> will run you about 700 bucks. Comes with those 10 movies, a really odd collection of those things. The 4K movie service that this device will be able to stream content from won't be available till the fall the service uh, sony says the service is going to have movies from sony pictures and other notable production houses so didn't mention any particulars on that but that's 
what the service is going to have. And Sony Electronics president Phil Molyneux already told The Verge back in February that the PS4 would be able to access that media streaming service. You and can you do you understand the point of this FMP X1 player? Why would anybody want to get this at the price of seven hundred dollars? Um, well, seven hundred dollars, I think, is probably a keen price for for something that's going to play four K. Uh, what you get in the media in in the format, in terms of whether it's it's going to be able to come down the pipe fast enough, uh, is debatable. Uh, the TVs, uh, from what I understood, four K is kind of pointless under eighty inches. So uh, 55 and 65 inch models doesn't really make a great deal of difference to your viewing pleasure compared to standard HD. Sarah, um, that low price isn't going to get you in the door. Six thousand dollars, like, oh, well, that's not so bad. I'm going to buy the the the, 80, the uh, 84 inch one for twenty five thousand. Yeah, no. Oh, uh, man, I'd pay seven thousand dollars to watch Cameron Diaz in Bad Teacher in, on his own. <laughs> <laughs> what a what a list of movies. It's I a, wouldn't. It's a strange collection. Oh. I mean, obviously, it's you know what they had rights to or whatever. Bridge uh, on the River Kwai. Out of the gate. Total Recall, the remake. Um, $6,000 is still way too much, I think, for a vast majority of people who are in the market for new TVs. But yeah, it's starting to get to the point where you're like, oh, okay, we're in the single digits as far as uh, television prices. I'm a little confused, though. If the PS4 can access the same content, at least in, in the near future... We, yeah, what? Why do I want this 4K media player as mm. well? Why don't they just want to push PS4s that much more? The only thing I could think of is that this is bundled with those movies, and the PlayStation 4 probably won't be, but 10 movies that are going to be... They're not that compelling. Is there any set of movies that Sony could have put together? If they gave you the whole Bond collection, or they gave you all the Spider-Man movies, or all of these things, when does this price actually become worthwhile? Because I was looking at the competition. I was like, what exactly has... 4K content, and there was this Red Ray player from Red that makes those awesome 4K cameras, but it costs like $1,500 and uses a proprietary format, and they don't have any movies either. So this kind of concept of where else can you go, $700 sounded crazy in a vacuum to me, but looking up for other content, where else are you going to even get this content? Because I don't think anything can play that. What do you think, Tom? I think you've got to this look at the... So oh, sorry. Oh, no, 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 that's all right. I'm just going to say, this is an early adopter thing. This is this mm -hmm. is for, for people who have a lot of disposable income, want to be the first on their block. $700 is cheap. And that maybe the, in their home theater setup, a gaming console just wouldn't isn't done right. They want they want something that is you know more more sophisticated, more home theater like, and so so they go for something like this. Ewan, what were you going to say? I was going to say if you look at the list of films that are there, you've got Bridge on the River Kwai and Taxi Driver were shot in at least thirty five millimeter, if not better. So they're the only ones that are going to scale to four K anyway. I can't believe that Bad Teacher was shot in 4K. It's going to be shot in 1080 probably and upscaled or 2.5K and upscaled. And the others, Total Recall, again, I don't believe that was probably shot in 4K. So these are all, these are all uh, probably, I don't want to get sued, but I would have said that they were, they were, they were upscales. They might have done though. I mean, it, they might have used a red camera and, and shot 4K and then edited down from that. It's, it's not impossible. Karate Kid 2010 with the red. Mm -hmm. so. Well, they could have shot it on people shoot on film, red. which is unusual still in this day and age, but then you scan it at a higher res, just like you can take a print from a really old movie from a, from 35 millimeter. But I, I'm I, just saying. I don't, see, I don't see the point of this just yet, because I was looking at the price. $6,000 doesn't sound so bad for a TV anymore, but what are you going to watch on it? Yeah. There's, there's like one network in the whole United, in the whole world that, that shows live video in 4K, unless you want to have four 1080p images up at one time, like if you have... If you're ADD like me. Like, well, oh, no. and Ewan makes a good point. It's like, that's for a 55-inch television. I have a 55-inch television right now, uh, and the HD is pretty good. I can't get back far enough, you know, for for it to make much of a, or I guess close, really, for it to make much of a difference. You need a bigger TV and a bigger space for 4K to wow you, you know, to, to, for TVs to kind of be side by side where you say, wow, HD really is not good anymore. Most Unless you're going to be doing a lot of picture-in-picture picture zooming in yeah. or something, right? And that's why this is early adopter stuff. We were having the exact same conversation about HDTVs in 2003 because the prices were about the same, the amount of content was about the same, uh, and and this this is just to me it's the natural process that the product cycle goes through. And in, in 10 years, everybody will have 4K TVs. They'll be kicking around Ooh. all over the place. I think. I mean, Harrods have got an 80-inch. 4K TV there, and that looks phenomenal, but it's £28,000. Um, so the prices are very keen here. I think it's just whether you're going to get the benefit of looking at, as Sarah says there, a 55-inch TV that's playing uh, 4K. I don't, I don't think you'll see an, an enormous enough difference to make you go, wow.
Sarah's got a story about uh, two emerging trends meeting software defined networking, uh, which is an enterprise level thing you may or may not have heard of about, probably not, but HP you've heard of, and you've heard about how they need a new way forward. And uh, they've got a, a new server product today that might just be that way forward. What, what's this about, Sarah? Yeah, so this is uh, this is something that HP has been talking about for a while. Project Moonshot was announced 16 months ago, and Meg Whitman, CEO of HP, of course, has talked about this as a major source for new growth a handful of times since then. What HP is doing is going to commercially release a, uh, a new kind of server. Uh, it uses low-power Intel chips. HP says... Uh, it really saves a lot of energy, 89% less energy used. It's 80% smaller than the typical server that people would, you know, when you think of servers today. Also going to cost 23% uh, uh 23% as much overall, so a savings. Um, and HP is partnering with uh, many chip suppliers. So we've got Intel, we've got AMD, Applied Materials, Texas Instruments, um, making low-power chips that normally would be used uh, in mobile phones, this is all um, which, uh, was uh, revealed at an event in New York um, where HP was showing off this machine. Also, and this is kind of interesting, we talk so much about product cycles and how that industry seems to be, you know, sh uh, being being shook up uh, in, in a variety of different companies, says that they're going to make new versions of these servers once every three to six months. So they're going to get off of a, a yearly cycle, um, which is what most people, you know, equate with, with uh with server advancements. They're shaped like cartridges, the servers servers themselves. They snap into enclosures. Servers will have different performance characteristics. So it's sort of like a, ooh, we, you know, pick and choose type of a thing based on what a company needs. And then if you're a big company, you're a customer, you've got a large data center, you can kind of mix and match uh, your servers uh, to suit the needs of, of, of your business and your consumers. It's interesting, too, David Donatelli, who's the GM of HP's server and storage and networking business, says, uh, we sold more than 12 billion of our older servers in 2012. So this is not like a completely new thing where the, 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 the model is completely turned on its head. He says sales and volume of the new versions uh, will probably start in 2014, um, and the change is underway. So we're, we're in a transition period. I, as to me, this seems like... Hey, you know, it's uh, more power efficient, makes more sense. You've got servers that suit the needs of, of your customers that much more. Is this is this going to save HP? Do you think that they've uh, they've got something going on here? Yeah, being a part of the infrastructure of, of, of all the cloud computing and everything else that's going on the internet, it's an intelligent play. HP has done a ton of stuff on enterprise. They've done things with servers for the longest time. Uh, so the idea that they are coming out with something they can rev consistently and then also have a way to make those revisions and then the people don't the people who bought into it don't have to replace every piece because these are modules or cartridges so you have this uh, effectively a, not a future proofing but it's almost like HP's figuring out okay we need to make sure that everybody's buying our products on a consistent way and if we're running the backbone we're running the infrastructure of of everything that's really helpful because there's no, what else could you do the consumer side they're really trying but maybe they're not getting the message across there they can probably appeal to enterprise and servers a lot easier you and uh, I know the uh, the topic of servers. You know, I, I don't know how, how how often you think about servers and enclosures and how many cartridges can fit into you know one uh, in a in a server farm somewhere. But this makes a lot of sense. I mean, this is just you know this is just a smarter way to run a server business, isn't it? I, I think uh, the devil here is definitely looking at whether they live up to the hype or not of what they're actually saying here, whether it actually mm -hmm. delivers at, at what it says. But if it does, I think this could be a very you know, almost a killer blow. I spend a lot of time working for multinational firms as a photographer, but they're running projects. And the big problem that they've got with projects is, is how to set up a temporary service for three to six month durations at locations, get it to function, collapse, take it down again afterwards. And you end up with them uh, virtually, you know, someone has a computer that they then set up to try and file handle, and then someone has to dump that back to the main servers afterwards. If they can create microservers that people can set up and move around very easily, that's the way that business is going, particularly in the projects market. If you also look at um, large multinationals, they've got divisions and those divisions have been broken down into smaller and smaller business units and they're hiring smaller and smaller premises for 10 to 20 to 30 people so something that's a micro server that can be set up that easily administered very easily maybe remote administered and provide those people with server access to the main systems 
as I think is an absolute masterstroke on their part. If it does what it says it does, that's the key problem. I think when you look at this in conjunction uh, with the other announcement HP is part of today with Cisco and Juniper Networks about Open Daylight, which is a, an open source software defined networking platform. It's, it's kind of a piece alongside of something like Hadoop. Uh, this shows that HP is finally getting out in front of a trend before they fall to it, unlike with their consumer market, where they seem to have been behind the eight ball, even though they tried to get into tablets, it just didn't work. Now they're teaming up with the big guys to flight off things like Project Floodlight, which is smaller companies and another open source project saying you know what we need we need to make sure we keep our advantage in networking in the enterprise and what we do is servers we're going to make these servers and and the other thing about these servers they're not only small you can fit enough of these in a rack uh that a normal size server would take eight racks so it's space efficient as well now you can't do high level scientific stuff on this stuff but you can you can do web servers and that's what the facebook's and the google's of the world are, are trying to do so i think this is really smart uh, for HP and, and probably good news for HP stockholders, although the stock doesn't seem to be reacting necessarily exactly that way. Google wants to buy something up and it's WhatsApp. What, what's up with buying WhatsApp, IOS? Yeah, this is a strange story. Like I mentioned, the news news Digital Trends is saying that Google wants to acquire WhatsApp for about a billion dollars. Uh, WhatsApp is a messaging app that runs on lots of platforms, including Android, iOS, BlackBerry, and Windows Phone. And it lets, it's effectively uh, an SMS replacement. You can you can send text messages, in, uh, uh, instant messages, images, videos, audio to each other if you're on the application. Uh, Digital Trends says that WhatsApp processed 18 billion messages on New Year's Eve 2012 alone. And the fee structure for WhatsApp is, is relatively interesting. On the iPhone, you pay a dollar for the application and you can use it forever. For the other phone types, though, WhatsApp is free to download and try for the first year. And then they charge you a dollar per year after that. And Google obviously already has a ton of different services, including Google Voice, Google Talk, Google Messenger, Google Hangouts. And I think they even own Mebo at this point. Ewan, what would Google even need another communications tool for? What is what would... But what makes sense for WhatsApp? Users. I think they've got absolutely no need for the tech whatsoever. I mean, from what I understood uh, WhatsApp does, I, I think you could probably get a couple of smart engineers and sit them down for uh, two weeks and have I I the equivalent same thing. I think what they bring is users. That's where the money is. That's where the outlet is for Google. Um, I, the only thing I would say is that if you're trying to get someone from a, a walled environment like WhatsApp where people are there because it's cool and it's new and it's different and fulfills their functions and then you start trying to lever and, and crank them into the Google verse I think people would react and go well, well I want something else I want to go elsewhere and look for this they won't be able to just buy this rebadge it and expect people to stay there it'll have to stay as it currently is but it's users it's not it's not tech I don't think Sarah do you think that there would be a backlash if Google picked this company up it seems like it's a, it's a function why would that change anything I don't think Google cares I mean when Facebook bought Instagram people went oh no Instagram is gonna change and it really hasn't <laughs> uh, and it was just the same kind of thing Instagram was up and coming had a huge user base Facebook paid a lot of money for it I think it's the same idea here I mean 18 billion messages on New Year's Eve? Think about that for a second. This is a very popular app. That makes a lot of sense for Google. Yeah, Google's got its own services that, you know, are in some ways competitors to WhatsApp. But this is Google, um, you know, it's, this is like a land grab for the cool services, right? There, there are quite a few of them now. They've got huge user bases, and Google wants that. Tom, can you see this being a defensive move at all? Are there any companies that should be looking at this? I believe that uh, WhatsApp was started by two guys who used to work at Yahoo. Yeah, I, I mean, it, yeah, I think Ewan's right. It's users. Uh, I think also you want engineers, and you got some smart engineers, so it could be an act higher element to it as well. Uh, and I think it is a defensive move. I think Google... And, and maybe a bit of an offensive move too. Remember, we talked last week about the uh, the rising tide of these messenger apps kind of taking over social networking space from the likes of Facebook and Twitter. Now, Google really wants you to get into Google Plus. I mean, that's the word is that's why they killed Google Reader is because they really want to put all their stuff into social networking into Google Plus. It makes sense to me from that aspect to say let's buy WhatsApp uh, and let's take what they've learned and take that juice and direct it towards Google Plus. And that's why what Ewan's saying makes sense, which is we're going to direct those users towards Google Plus, whether it work or not, I don't know. But WhatsApp is a very popular messenger app. And if Google can get on top of that and actually have that as a brand uh, that they that they continue to make popular, they, they're ahead of a trend for once instead of falling behind. 
if if Google does acquire this, I hope they don't mess it up too badly. When they when they bought Grand Central and they made it into Google Voice, they stripped out a ton of functionality. They went with that flat Google styling. It, it, I used to use Grand Central back when it was Grand Central and it was great. And then Google Voice kind of was kind of cruddy. If if Google's going to bother to do this, they should really do this before they unify all of their services because there was that rumor a while ago that Google Babel is coming. This thing that's going to unify talk, messenger, voice, all this stuff, all in one thing. So if they're going to bother to merge everything, grab as many other companies as you want to go into this new product. Because if if they introduce Babel and then they have another thing that's outside of it, that's a big mistake. Also, they both use XMPP. They should be able to talk to each other. So maybe if Google can just get talk to work with WhatsApp, to work with everything else, I think that might be a good position. All right, let's uh, finish up with a new suitor for Hulu. Uh, as we've been following, Hulu's really showing some leg out there, trying to get interest. <laughs> Peter Chernin, who architected Hulu when he was COO of News Corp, he was one of the main hands, he was on the board of Hulu, saying, let's, let's figure this out. Then he left News Corp. Now he's saying, hey, $500 million enough for you? Apparently, Hulu wants $2 billion, so there's a lot of space between those two bids. But uh, Chernin has mused publicly about how someone might create an online-only competitor to HBO, and that would seem to be a great thing if he could get it at a price that made sense for him, is to ch snap up Hulu and start doing what Netflix has been doing, which is making an online competitor to HBO by having high-quality original programming. And Hulu already does some of that, absolutely. Uh, but they could really throw their weight and make that their big thing. Then the licensing of all the content doesn't become as important However, that's why he only wants to pay $500 million is he doesn't think he has the licensing deals to make it worth $2 billion. So there may be some wiggle room there to say, give me more licensing deals. I'll pay you more for this. Uh, you and I, I know we were talking beforehand. You're like, I don't even get Hulu. But you guys get you get Netflix. You get Love Film uh, in the UK. Uh, over in Scandinavia, they have HBO online only. So the trend is right now for a lot of companies to be creating these online only components that maybe start by bringing in existing television programs, but are also creating their own television programs that you can only get through these services. Do you think that, that something like this could work if an independent company came in or an independent guy like Charon came in and bought the service? <sighs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, certainly Netflix over here, we get that, and House of Cards uh, and Lilyhammer and that kind of stuff has gone down great guns. And the beauty of that system is instead of having to wait every week for something to come out, it's just blah, these 13 episodes, wade through them as much as you want, at the speed that you want. I think the thing with Hulu, though, is that... Um, there was a there was a prospective IPO for them a couple of years ago that estimated them at $2 billion, And I reckon there's going to be... An IP, or they had a scheduled IPO probably in the next 12 months. Um, and I think the Facebook thing has kind of shocked them a little bit, and they don't think they're going to go for what they think they're going to go for. So I think they're looking to try and, and maybe get someone in at the ground level to do more with them and probably get the best bang for their buck that they possibly can and then float maybe in a few more years if that really does come up. Um, you know, that, it, the, it's the interesting revenues, about the valuation. Sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, the, the, if you're talking about the valuation at five hundred thousand dollars, five hundred uh, million dollars, you know, they, they're turning over six hundred, seven hundred million dollars a year anyway. So that that still seems a little bit light, but they they are on a two billion dollar business with the amount of debt they, they're carrying. Well, the other interesting thing is that two billion dollar valuation was used for Providence Equity to buy themselves out a couple of years ago, or I guess just last year for two hundred million, and Ooh. they took that two hundred million and they invested it in Peter Chernin's foundation. So. Does Providence Equity know something here? Is this is this a bet on their part? What do you think uh, is going on here, Ias? Well, I think I think Hulu's just trying to figure out what it's going to do with itself after after it lost a CEO and they have a new guy coming in. I, they have to find their way. And Hulu's had such a contentious relationship with its owners. It's been a really strange thing going there. And I know that News Corp apparently wants to go more towards the Hulu Plus style, where everything is pay. Uh, ABC and Disney they want things to be more. Uh, more like it is now. It's a lot more free streaming. And then you have the, the, the value add of Hulu Plus. It's I just think that all the conflicts going on above above the actual content is causing so many problems that a $500 million bid might just simply be like, hey, look, give it. I, I'll take this company. I'll clear everything up. And you don't have to worry about this stuff anymore because the relationships that exist right now are kind of messy.
Now, the other thing is Chernin worked very closely with Jason Killar. And when Chernin left, a lot of people feel like that's when things started to go downhill for Jason Killar. And that was one of the things that led to him leaving as CEO. Uh, Sarah, do you, do you think that that also could be something where Chernin and Killar have planned to re-team up on, a, on an independent Hulu somehow? Yeah, maybe. Uh, they certainly seem to have a close relationship, so that would make sense. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it just kind of turns into a, all right, well, it's 500 million too low-balled is just not going to make sense. I mean, if you factor in the fact that you've got licensing rights, you've got 300 million in debt that has to be dealt with, then all of a sudden the, the price starts to look a little bit more attractive. Um, I'm just interested in seeing how this would change the Hulu experience for people who are paying for Hulu Plus. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, Hulu Plus is really good uh, for certain shows, uh, but it's also really limited. And it's it's you could think of Hulu and Netflix get lumped together as sort of similar services, but they're not really. Uh, it's 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 yeah. different. And um, you know, in many ways, uh, there is not anything about Hulu that um, uh, that certain people want to pay for because a lot of it is you know network television or you already have a cable connection. You know, Netflix has got uh, original programming that's that's really really working. Uh, House of Cards, of course, is the most obvious example of something that's like universally loved by everyone. Who's got original stuff too? And I'd be interested to see how that expands down the road because I assume um, that that they're working on it. Do you think the uh, the issue with the difference between Hulu that you're talking about there, Sarah, between Hulu and Netflix is is the business model style of the two companies, whereas you've got Netflix that is charging a very small amount for an incredibly good service that's got loads of old stuff, but great, you know, if you're stuck bedridden on a Saturday afternoon with a cold or something, it's good to flick through, find something you watched in the 70s or 80s and you're happy, mm -hmm. whereas the Whereas Hulu is is owned by the big corporations, is owned by the Disney's, who aren't going to go. Let's just give it away, you know, free or, or reduced price, just to get people watching, just to get people interested. These people are hardened business, want to return, want it now. Whereas Netflix is more of a, I find it a bit more of an egalitarian business model. Yeah, I, 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 Sarah, did were, were you asking that of Sarah, or is that just an open? Uh, anyone, just an open question, I suppose. Yeah, no, I, 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 I Sarah's think you're right. point about the differences. Yeah, I think that I think that what I would like to see in a new owner is focus on Hulu because I'm still puzzled on what I get when I pay and what I get when I don't pay, uh, and I, I've continued to keep my Hulu subscription on pause because of that, and I I never seem to really need to get anything. On the other hand, they've got some great stuff on there. Uh, for the for instance, the booth at the end, uh, which I believe started uh, as a Canadian show, and then Hulu picked it up and kept it going. Uh, online is a great show. So if they had a little more budget, a little more oomph behind them, the way Netflix has done uh, with Arrested Development, House of Cards, Lilyhammer, uh, I would love. I'd love to see what Hulu would do as, a as an independent when they were out from under the thumb of their corporate sponsor. Wait, did you just say that you don't really get what what you get extra if you pay for Hulu Plus versus just use Hulu? Yeah, I don't. I don't. I keep my my Hulu subscription on pause, and I never have to take it off. But how, okay, if you were to watch Hulu programming, how would you watch it? Just via your browser? On the, on a browser and then airplay it. All right. Yeah. Well, fine. <laughs> Let's move on to the randomizer. <laughs> Liquid Robotics has launched a new generation of wave glider ocean robots. Uh, they've been doing this for a while, apparently, which is news to me. It's it's pretty awesome. These wave gliders have floated more than 9,000 miles across the Pacific Ocean, totally self-guided. They have sensors. They do a lot of research. They usually use wave energy for propulsion and solar power for sensors and communications. But now the new ones can actually use solar power for propulsion as well, meaning that extends the range of them. I, we hear a lot about drones flying through the air. I haven't heard about wave gliders out there doing research before. Have any of you guys? Nope. First I've heard of it. It's pretty cool, though. Yeah. Just an, an army of robots. So we've got these guys. management. We've got these things just going independent on their own. We've got that, those robot jellyfish things we saw last week. Mm -hmm. the, the oceans is going to be full of our robots, and the fish are going to be scared. I think, I think the thing that you've got with this is the... Uh, I mean, they, didn't they do a circumnavigation of the globe with a, an autonomous boat just, re, just last year? It had taken it 16 months or something like that. No kidding. Really? All, all the way around? 
I think so. I can't, I've just got that in the back of my head. I, I, yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. facts to back that up. But I think the problem that you've got with uh, drones is and autonomous vehicles is the fact that you're going to need some seriously good legislation for these soon because there's so many out there that... Um, I mean, there was someone saying, well, someone saying that one of the Al Qaeda websites, sympathise websites, had got <laughs> had got plans on how to make a drone. On it, you know, everyone has got a drone. Everyone can buy drones, and they're easily made, easily flown, and and they could become a menace soon. Yeah. Uh, I, on the other hand, it, using these for research on the ocean seems like it could be yeah. a good thing. I don't know. It's weird, weird stuff. Drone wars, matter of time. Oh, Mm. War on the seven seas. Wave Navy. Let's see what's on the calendar. All right. All right. Starting on Monday, April 8th, uh, sites all across the web are actually um, are joining a, what they're calling a week of action. This is the Internet Defense League, which is the same groups that uh, were actively fighting against SOPA to fix the CF. AA. If you're interested, you can go to fixthecfaa.com for more information. AdTech, uh, the conference starts tomorrow, uh, runs through Wednesday in San Francisco. Black Rock Shooter, the game, is heading to PlayStation on April 23rd. Namco Bandai has revealed, this is through the game's official website, that June 5th is the official release date of the 3DS game Project X Zone. This is a strategy RPG crossover. So you've got characters from Namco Bandai's games as well as Sega and Capcom. Should make uh, some folks happy as well. Again, that's uh, June 25th. Excellent. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. Uh, got a caller who sees Facebook Home's potential tracking as familiar. Caller, explain. Hey, guys, just wanted to make a quick comment on the uh, story of Facebook Home on episode 726. Uh, Sarah had a uh, comment about uh, Facebook learning your home and uh, other aspects about you, but uh, Google Now uh, does this actually very well and uh, found out where I live. Uh, where I worked and uh, gave me the stock quote of the company I worked for just after a couple days. Okay, thanks. Bye. Yeah, I think, um, again, I, I think we talked about the fact that clearly Facebook is not tapping into technology that other companies don't have access to. It's just that there's a Facebook reputation to contend with, right? People tend to trust Facebook perhaps less than Google. I don't know. It depends on the person, right? I don't know. I like Google now knowing what I'm doing. Like, they should be figuring things out for me anyway. That's maybe why I'm not so scared it's of Facebook It's completing home. your sentences after a while, too. I like that. It's I like, just, I think it's me. cool, it's my too. my soulmates. Anyway, we're going it, it, it is kind of perception, right? People have not got a good perception of Facebook protecting privacy. And I'm not saying they have a great perception of Google, but it certainly isn't as bad. Facebook's the one that everyone always think of thinks of as invading your privacy. So, yeah, I mean, th these are very similar things, but one of them people tout and say, oh, yeah, no, that's a great thing. It knows exactly where I am at all times. That's not creepy. We got an email from Tony from Albany. He says, hey, TNT crew, I was listening to Friday's episode where you discussed game companies requiring internet access to play games, such as SimCity, as well as the speculation that the new Xbox might require it. The issue I have not heard anyone discuss that really bothers me is the question of how long a game will be supported. Maybe I'm missing something, but what if the unthinkable happens and EA goes out of business, for example? Or does a game company decide to shut down servers to save money when only a handful of people are playing in some number of years they consider a reasonable lifetime? Is there some kind of fail-safe to this kind of internet copy protection that I'm not aware of? That's a really interesting point. What happens when the servers shut down? Hackers. But you're only renting the game anyway. There you go. That's the new it's reality. Just, it's licensing. So it's you're licensed to use it as long as they say you're licensed to use it. If they remove that license, bad luck. Maybe this will bring back board games. Just like, <laughs> It never is offline. Actually, it's Absolutely. always offline and it's always available. <laughs> always off. Hey, man. Ta they, tabletop games haven't gone away. They're, they're bigger than ever. It's just uh, maybe this will give them a boost. They have the big on the Absolutely. box. No subscription fee needed. Yeah, exactly. New marketing campaign. <laughs> all right. Well, that is uh, all for us today. You and Rankin, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I hope I hope your back held up well through this. Oh, I'm fine. I'm just okay. It's yeah, when I get up. We didn't notice a twinge. So I hope you're on the mend quick. Uh, let folks know about British Tech Network and what they can find there. It's great stuff over there. Yeah, we've uh, we've been going for over a year now. We had the Bagel Tech before that, but we've got eight shows each week. We've got Photo Show, Big Show, which you're on regularly, and the Mac Show, uh, which Andy and that goes on, and uh, and plenty of others. Jeff Gamut comes on regularly. Uh, Photo Show, uh, Gamer Show, iOS Show. We we we've got eight shows running each week, um, and it's just 
mates sitting around having a chat, just chewing the cut over the general tech news and specific news and enjoy it. BritishTechNetwork.com. Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks for uh, having me on there as much as you have. It's really fun hanging out with you guys. No, we love you coming on. It's great. We, we, the idea of, of the shows is, is to relax, enjoy, and, and just talk like you're down the pub, and the people that are listening are just eavesdroppers. BritishTechNetwork.com. Don't forget, also, you can submit stories uh, in our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. Let folks know what stories you'd like us to cover. Maybe even vote on the stories that uh, other people, in fact, not maybe, do it. Go vote on those stories that other people have submitted, technewstoday.reddit.com. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us. Our email address is tnt at twit.tv. And give us a call. Leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll be back tomorrow with Raj Diut as our guest. See you then.